that's really weird that people don't really know you know Ayers Rock or Uluru you're supposed to say now right the thing in Australia yeah. right there exists the same thing in Newfoundland and it's only like three places on the planet where that because it's basically what happens right is that the crust of the earth is iron really and that basically the crust have come up like upside down and that's why it's red because it's rust and nothing can grow on it because it's rust, right? And this, there's the same thing in north of Cornerbrook in, oh, what is this called? There's a huge national park up there. Uh, I can't remember now. My friend used to work in it. And it's just bizarre because you basically have this massive red mountain. Right. Yeah. Which is just odd. Then you think, like, hang on, isn't this in Australia? And then there's a fjord next to it, basically. You're like, it's just weird. Oh, it's so man. cool. <laughs> oh man, I feel I feel like a bad Canadian now for not uh, not visiting there. No, no, no. But it's the same thing, right? You know, if you would go to Sweden, you would see a lot more than I have, right? Everyone travels where they sure. don't live, right? It's yeah, it's yeah. always this thing. Right. So uh, welcome everybody. Uh, very happy to, to host uh, Carl Heinrich Eck uh, today uh, to give a talk on compositional functions and uncertainty. Uh, Carl is a senior lecturer at the University of Cambridge and with uh, Professor Neil Lawrence, uh, Ferenc Huzar, and Jessica Montgomery. He leads the newly formed machine learning research group uh, in the Com Cambridge Computer Lab. Uh, he's interested in building models that allow for principal treatment of uncertainty and interpretability. Uh, Carl, welcome to Oatmeal. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for that kind introduction. So I'm going to try and give this talk about composite functions and specifically about uncertainty in this. Uh, it might be a little bit of a different talk because I might be a bit Trump-esque and say a lot of negative things, but not actually provide any solutions to anything. But the hope is that at least we can all recognize some of these problems and then hopefully we can think about ways of addressing them. So specifically, I'm gonna talk about composite functions, right? So composite function is just a function in a function in a function in a function, right? Which in itself is just a function. So now apparently, these things are quite useful, as we've noticed. There's been a lot of work done on these in the last couple of decades of machine learning. And some people like to call this deep learning. Uh, I think mathematicians call them composite functions. So I refer to them as composite functions. So in many ways, I try to stay away from this because it confused me a lot. But then certain problems that we work on are composite in nature. And the first thing that I saw uh, where I had to start thinking about these things was reinforcement learning. So here I have the state update for a single step of reinforcement learning. So in orange, I have my current state and I got my dynamical model F and I got my policy pi. So to update my state in this case, right, what I have to do is I have to propagate the uncertainty from these orange things to first take my, execute my policy to get an action. And then I have to propagate that in itself through the dynamics model to get my new state. So here we got clearly a composite function and reinforcement learning itself is specified in these terms. So it's kind of hard to get away from this in itself. The other thing where this came up with was a project that we had a couple of years ago, which was about modeling wind farms. So in this case, uh, it was a wind park that sits outside the island of Gotland in Sweden. And what we have in this case is that the only measurements that we can take from these is the actual electricity that is produced. And now what we wanted to do was to model this thing. And what you can either do is you can take uh, 
and compartmentalize this whole thing as a wind farm object. And you can try and model this. But if I do that, I throw away all the knowledge that I have of this system. So what I specifically know in this case is that we've actually built the turbines. So I know a lot of that. And I also know a lot about the characteristics of the wind. So in order to use that information, I have to build this up as a composite model. So now when approached with this problem, I then thought, well, easy peasy, this shouldn't be too hard, right? I spent most of my career working on how to model functions. So now I just have to put them into each other and everything will just work out. And that led to a couple of surprising things to me that was a bit unintuitive that led to lots, I think, interesting questions and work that we need to address. So in specific today, what I'm going to try and talk about is that what are the characteristics that compositions have? And now we already know empirically that these characteristics are very beneficial when we're building predictive models, or which I like to call their algorithmically beneficial. But when we actually build statistical models, these beneficial things actually turns out to be quite challenging and actually, in many cases, have quite the opposite effect for things. So I'm going to start off with talking about what I think these characteristics are of our comp uh, compositional functions. But to begin with, to just give a highlight of what I want towards the end. So I'm going to talk about something which I like to call just compositional uncertainty, which is what I would want from a um, compositional model. So in this case, I got on the leftmost pane, I got some input data, which is the solid square. And then I have some output. So I want to transform this input to be the dashed square. There is no uncertainty whatsoever in the input. There is no uncertainty whatsoever in the output. But now I want to compose this in terms of two rotations and two translations. And now I have some beliefs over what I think these rotations and these translations should be. So what I would want from a model is something that says, well, actually, if I start off from left to right, there's a set of rotations that I can do. Then from these rotations, there's a set of translations that I can do. And then there's a set of rotations from that. And then that gives me one final translation. So I have a system which is not uncertain from input to output, but it's something that's decomposed in between, right? So that's my aim, and that's what we're going to hopefully come to in the end. And I'm going to try and show why this is actually quite challenging to do. So everything that I'm going to say today that's wrong is solely my fault. Everything that I say that's going to be good and that you like come from these nice people who've actually done the work, right? So there's a lot of people who worked on this problem or this work. So in specific, Ivan, Yeva, Eric, Marcus, and Neil Campbell. Some of them are at this table from a very nice pre-pandemic workshop in Munich where we drank lots of beer and ate opatsta. So back to composite functions. So Let's look at these functions and see what they actually do. So the first, so something has gone wrong with this present. Oh, hang on. Let's see. Yeah, sorry. Forgot to update the presentation. Uh, so let's go and look at these composite, composite functions. So the first two characteristics that you can think of when it comes to functions, right? It's the image of a function, which is the set of outputs that the function can take. And then you have the kernel of the function, which is a set of points that maps to the same value. So what happens when you put these into compositions? Well, the kernel of a composite function can only ever grow with the number of compositions. 
And this is quite natural, right? If you have two points and they map to the same value, the next composition can never unmap those two points to make it more points again. So the kernel continuously grows and the image therefore continuously shrinks. So what we're actually getting here is that by building compositional functions, we are creating a way to reduce our representative power of the output, right? So we're continuously reducing the, um, the representative power of our function. So why would you ever want to do this? Well, algorithmically, this is super useful. So let's say that we have this task here. So I have, say, a classification problem. And let's now say that my input x are images and my output are some classes. The important task of classifying images into cats, dogs, and Carl Henry's mom. So now, obviously, what I want to do now is that I want to find a function that goes from a very, very large input into a very, very small output. So ideally, what I want to do is that I want to create a kernel of my mom, right? So all images that represent my mom should actually map to the same value, and therefore I can associate that to the class label. So this is great. This is exactly what we want when we build these kind of predictive algorithms. So now the next thing, if we look at, in the first case, I used to have two um, um, monotonic functions that did this. So we didn't really get any interesting structure. But now, if I now take and make a smooth, simple transformation of the first layer, I get a simple transformation of the output. But now, if I make another smooth transformation of the first layer, in this case, now I get quite a strong deformation on the output. If you actually look at the color coding of the input, I've taken two very simple functions, and I've gotten quite an interesting structure on the output. And this will only increase with the number of layers. So to give a more intuitive example of this, because I basically got tired of drawing LaTeX figures to show this, I am going to show an example which we'll come back to quite a few times. It's a silly example, but I think it's quite useful to see what we get. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try and model this step function. So I have a function which is not differentiable once. And what I'm going to do is that I'm going to try and model this as layers of functions, compositions, functions, which are all very smooth. So what happens when I do this? So I first fit a function. I take some linear regression. In this case, I've got six basis functions. So what I can see happening is that my points that sit close to the nonlinearity in this case gets pushed apart. I get the points which are on here and on here, they get pushed together. If I keep doing this for a while, donk, 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 what we'll see is that basically, eventually, I've compressed this now to just being two simple points which very, very well fits the smoothness assumption that I started off with. So this is really beneficial. Because what we've actually have now is that we say I can construct a very complicated output structure from a set of very, very simple structures on, in the composition. And this is super beneficial, right? Because this meant that I can compartmentalize things into having very, very simple small building blocks while they together give something quite complicated on the output. So the next thing that I wanted to highlight is if I now start altering things. So in this case, I do a small alteration on an early composition. I can get very, very large changes on the output. And this turns out also to be very, very beneficial, especially in terms of optimization, right? Because it leads to when I do stochastic optimization on these things, that it reduces the possibility of getting stuck. I can do small parameter changes, which can lead to very large changes on my output. And then the last thing here, which is also a benefit in terms of optimization, is that 
there's many, many solutions. When I build these compositions, I basically just increase the number of symmetries that I have in this problem. So now I've got many, many solutions that will lead to exactly the same problem. Now it turns out this also, there's enough empirical evidence that this is really, really beneficial in terms of optimization. Because apparently what it leads to is that you now have multiple solutions that will lead you to an optimal result in some way. And searching for those are actually, there's a higher chance of finding one of them if there's many. Cool. So what I tried to highlight here was that three characteristics which I think and believe are really responsible for why these things work really well as predictive models, right? So we've got simple functions in compositions give rise to complicated composite behaviors. Second thing is then that small changes in early compositions give rise to large changes in these composite behaviors as well. So while the first thing was really saying, this is fantastic, I just need to build these building blocks and then now I can just look at ways of of making them interact in interesting ways. The second thing is really seems to be something that gives rise to an easier search. And then the last bit was this idea of overparameterization. And this overparameterization also seems to be very beneficial to search. So now I'm going to argue that while all these things are beneficial for predictive models, when we build statistical models, they're actually not that beneficial in many ways. So I'm going to begin with the last point here, this overparameterization and this symmetries that we have. So if I end up in this case that we had, where I got these two solutions, which are actually equivalent, they're equivalent under the data that I have. So the data, with the data, it's infeasible for me to actually say which one of these I should pick. But most likely they're different where the question marks is, right? So in order to somehow get somewhere, I need to actually add something else. And now I'm gonna show this image. So this image here is my sketch of what I think machine learning is. So this image tries to convey a Pareto front. So what I'm saying here is that I have a problem that I can solve. And this Pareto front is different ways of solving this problem. On one axis, on the X axis, I got data. And on my Y axis, I got knowledge or beliefs. And on one end of the spectrum, I can be down here. So now I'm in the scenario where I've seen everything I'm ever gonna see. Now I don't need any knowledge whatsoever. Now, this is not machine learning, it's just a lookup table. On the other end of the spectrum, I have truth. If truth exists, I know exactly how everything works. I need no data whatsoever to solve this problem. This is not machine learning either. To me, machine learning is everything that sits in between here. The task of machine learning is coming up with ways of mixing data with knowledge somehow to reach this solution. And there's always a trade-off between the two that you can do. And while we've seen lots of advances in the last decade or so, where we've said, actually, we can move down this path of actually going by adding more and more and more data, we can actually reduce the amount of beliefs we need about systems. And what effectively I think that we've seen over the last couple of decades is that we've pushed the concept of smoothness very, very far, because that's pretty much the only knowledge that we put into a lot of these systems. Okay, so how do we then think about parameterizing knowledge? Because many tasks, and the task that I'm interested in, we cannot actually have a lot of data. So at the moment, the way most of us think about this is that we think about this as probability distributions, right? So we think about beliefs or knowledge as a probability distribution over some variable. So all of us, when we grew up, or most of us, and if you're parents, you might be having this discussion at one point soon, the talk, 
right? So some people call this, I think in the US, it's called the flowers and the bees talk. And it's something that no parent looked forward to. As a machine learning teacher and supervisor, you also have a talk. It's the talk about where does uncertainty come from? And in the beginning, most people have very skewed ideas about this. Those ideas, I've learned the predictive model. Can't I just measure uncertainty and now predict this as well? Nothing could be further away from the truth, I would argue. So where does actually uncertainty come from, right? So the object that we're interested in that we build statistical models is the marginal likelihood, right? So the marginal likelihood is the thing that we're trying to maximize. And we get this distribution by constraining it through a model. And this model takes two objects. We have a likelihood, which basically quantifies the value of one specific hypothesis and how much evidence there is in the data for that hypothesis, and our cyan bit, which is our prior, which is our beliefs over what hypotheses have generated why. So that is the object that we're interested in. So now, the reason why I'm doing a lot of this, hopefully will become clear reasonably soon. So what is then a good prior? And to me, I think a good prior is something that explicitly explains the behavior of your hypothesis without data. And with explicit, I mean, you should explicitly know what you have said before you see data. And now, the other thing that I think a good prior, or the way we should think about the good prior, and this is written in italic, because I'm gonna say a thing that disagrees with this. But a prior should never be judged from the behavior of the resulting posterior. If we do this, we're out on very, very thin ice. So what I mean by this, if you know how your posterior should look like, you have nothing to learn. You should just parameterize this. But if you'll know what your posterior should look like, or your predicted posterior, and then you're trying to search for a prior that gives rise to that, then you'll know better than Donald Trump. Then you're basically trying to say, I know I won this election, now go and find me the proof that does this. And this is what Noam Chomsky referred to as the inductivist fallacy. And this is a really, really scary point to be in. And I think in many learning systems, this is exactly what we do. And I'll try and avoid doing this in this talk and showing you priors or showing you posteriors and therefore justifying that my prior is right. However, there's a caveat to this. So if your posterior says something is false, the prior should be disregarded, right? So this comes from Karl Popper, right? Who says that any scientific theory needs to be falsifiable, right? If you can't falsify something, then it's not a scientific theory, right? So what we want to do is that you want to specify your hypothesis, and then you want to have tests that allows you to test your posterior to say if it means something. Now, if your posterior is surprising, it's not what you thought it to be, well, that's great. That's exactly what you want. That's the aim, right? That implies that you've learned something from data. If you haven't, well, then there's no point of learning something, right? So let me then start off with the first simple prior in this case, what people often refer to as a Bayesian neural network. So let's just think about doing the simplest thing in this case. So what we say is where we connect up a network and then we are going to put distributions over our weights in this network. I'm just going to put some Gaussian distributions over these at this point. So the first thing then is that by looking at this, I should be able to say something about the behavior of the functions. What have I actually said by saying this? So the nice thing now is that obviously we can sample from this. So if I sample and draw this plot, so I draw a standard deviation or whatever now it is, that prior you says that it says this, right? 
Now, I hate these plots. I think we should stop showing these plots and I'll come to even worse examples of these because they don't show anything. What I should be doing is that I should really draw samples from this. So if I draw samples from this thing and this prior, these are the functions that I have. So it looks like something that flattens out if I go away from the middle and I got more waviness in the middle. Then I can fit some data to this and I'm not saying that I'm an expert on training these, so you might get a much better result, but you know, this does something. I can now show you what happens if I go really, really far away from the data. This starts getting quite interesting. I didn't expect this, but again, as I said, I shouldn't judge my prior based on this. And now kind of comes my issue with this prior, to me, this is the only way I can judge it. I can judge it by looking at this posterior and say if it made sense. But then I become, end up in this inductivist fallacy again. So my argument for these things, because I cannot really reason, and this might be me not being clever enough, because I can't really reason about these priors, and that might be that I'm as I said, not clever enough. What I tend to see them as is that they're more a regularizer that helped me search rather than a prior. Because what it does is that it specifies a regularizer on the parameter space, but it, the connection to what the output actually is, how that actually specifies the distribution of the output is much harder to think about. So instead, I'm going to go to something which is a little bit closer to my heart and is a little bit simpler, and that is to talk about Gaussian processes. And Gaussian processes will have, and the reason why I'm talking about them is that they will actually manifest all the problems that I wanted to show. So to me, a Gaussian process is a good prior because it does explicitly explain the behavior of the function, not the behavior of the parameters. And I can say exactly, very clearly, how this behaves when I do not have any data. And that means that I can interpret my posterior because the posterior can only ever be interpreted in light of the assumptions that I've made. So, now, what I'm going to do is that we're going to now come back to this step function. And we are now going to throw a deep Gaussian process or a composite Gaussian process on this. What I'm going to do is that, can't for the world of me remember exactly how many layers I did, but I think it was eight or six or something like this. I'm going to say that on each layer, I am going to specify a prior that says that I want really, really smooth functions. Okay. So now the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to sample from the prior. So this is samples from this prior. So apparently by specifying these very, very smooth functions, the prior over the whole composition leads to a function that is bounded somehow, but it's varying incredibly quickly. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use this to fit this step function. And now we can look at this, and this looks awesome, right? You can see papers with this plot, and it looks nice. People like this. It looks like it becomes uncertain in the middle where the discrepancy is, and then the uncertainty goes up, and it looks like it looks like it goes away from the prior or back to the prior far away from the data. So now that plot, which I, as I said, I really, really dislike because they only show the marginal statistics. And now if you're learning a Gaussian process, what you're actually learning is you're learning the whole covariance between everything. So if we instead look at samples from this, this is going to look like this. So what this is, is that it basically says if you go far away from the prior, then you're either 
minus one or one, that's the value. If you go close to the data that's minus one, you're much more likely to be minus one, and the same thing at one. And in between the two, it jumps a lot. And now if you do some statistics on that and fit the Gaussian to it, you get the uh, plot that we had before. But this to me is very, very strange, right? There was nothing in the priors that I said were surprising to me initially that by specifying those compositions, these priors on each layer, it led to this prior. To me, that's not interpretable at all. So let's actually look at what's happening, which I think is the problematic thing when you start putting these things in compositions. So really, on the step function, we only have three different types of marginals. So we have points that are on the top part, uh, so the things that are one the whole time, they lie up here. We got the things that are minus one the whole time, they lie down here. And this here is my DP prior that I specified. So these two points, it kind of likes, and then you've got the thing that actually jumps. This one, it doesn't like at all, right? These points are very close, so it's going to get a very correlated Gaussian, but actually the output values are very far away from each other. So if we now first start looking at these two points, so what's actually happening when we're doing multiple layers? Of this thing. So this thing that we saw before where it pushes and pushes these points together, well that effectively means that by pushing them together we're making them closer and closer so without changing the parameters of the GP at all this is what's happening, right? So these points are going to become more and more and more and more likely that's the prior that we specify. And then if we look at the other point, the other marginal, uh, the things that sit on each side of the um, uh, discontinuity, that's going to get pushed apart. So if it gets pushed apart with the GP prior that I specified, this is basically going to lead to this, and it's going to automatically become more likely. So now, if I compare this, basically, what would happen with a shallow GP? So on a shallow GP, it's the leftmost plot, where my prior is the red thing, and my posterior is now the green thing. What I really, what would have happened in this case, which is very understandable, is that these two points here, they agree with my prior, so they support for my prior here. However, this point does not. And what I now want is that my posterior should now become more and more uncertain about this thing, right? So the, to try and describe this point, I need to become more uncertain everywhere. What's happening in the composite case, what the composite prior actually does, is that effectively it's by altering where these points actually are, now it can actually shrink and get an even tighter posterior. And now this, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just a strange, to me, a very hard behavior. It's a very strange behavior. So I like to show this like this, right? So if you have seen this plot before, which I hope you'll see, have seen. So this is David Mackay's famous plot that basically says or argues for why the marginal likelihood is the correct object to optimize for when we're trying to fit models. So the idea of this plot is that on the x-axis, you got data ordered according to complexity. So the x-axis, the ordering, comes from the prior that you've set. And then, which model should I pick? Well, the aim here is that if a model models something complex, it also models something simple. So what I should do is I should pick the model the model that maximizes the marginal likelihood at the data is the model that I have, which models up to the complexity of the data that I observe, but not more than that. So what kind of happens, and what's the surprising thing, what kind of happens with these compositional functions 
I like to think, is that basically the ordering of the x-axis now depends on the data itself, because my prior is no longer interpretable. So another way of thinking about this is that basically, if I think about this composite GP, as I think it is one GP at the bottom, and then I got all other GPs ahead of that. The only thing these GPs does in the beginning is transform the data to fit the prior that I set on the last layer. And now what I can effectively do is that I can do this in so many different ways because of the characteristics that we set before. So I can always find a case where my model only models my data and that's it. And what I've effectively done now is that I've thrown out my prior out the window completely. And then I have to have another quote from Karl Popper, a theory that explains everything explains nothing. Right. So even if these are very, very useful for predictive models, because we've got these small compartmentalized simple things that we can write code and put together and we can research different architectures to dust things. If we want to do something more, if we actually want to build statistical models, it becomes very problematic because effectively I can describe everything using these things. And that's the problem. And because I can explain everything, that doesn't tell me anything, right? Because I can't no longer justify the prior that I put in, because any prior will effectively explain anything. And that's really the issue. So now, should I just throw these things out then? Should I just never do these things? Well, that leads me back to this example. I think there's an argument, and I am going to argue for that, if you don't have composite knowledge, you should never ever use a composite function. That is wrong, I think. But if you have, your knowledge is truly composite, then you have to, right? Because otherwise you end up in a scenario where you can't use the knowledge that you have about the system. So how can we actually do this? How can we rectify some of the issues that we have? And a lot of the issues, that we have with these models comes from inference as well as the characteristics that I described above. So I'm now, if you're not familiar in detail with how we do inference in GPs, I'm not going to give too many details and not give too many maths. I'm going to hand wave this along and hopefully the intuitions will come across because those are the most important ones. So when we do approximate inference in GPs. These are intractable, so we need to do approximate inference. And we do this using variational bounds. And the way you normally do this is that you have this compositional structure as it's here. And what we do is that we say, I'm going to add, I'm going to augment another output or another part of the GP here, which I'm going to consider as a variational parameter. And then I'm going to consider these as independent across the layers. And then I'm going to fit this independent model as an approximation to this thing that correlates across the layers. So now, what does that independence lead to in terms of inference? So let's look at this thing. So let's think about compositional uncertainty as independent. So now, if I would have an identity function that goes through some sign function. So now if this is independent from the uncertainty here, what I will actually do when I generate the output of this, it's like taking this uncertain sine wave and then I move it back and forth. So I basically paint this thing in blue and now I get this massive uncertainty down here, right? Now, effectively at any point, I don't know if the uncertainty comes from the green or if the uncertainty comes from the red. And that's effectively what I want. But the problem is if I consider them independent, I get a lot of it. So now what that leads to when we do inference in these mechanisms is that we're maximizing or we're trying to fit this blue uncertainty to the data is that the models doesn't really at all. It's very, very careful at the inference time to add any uncertainty, because if the uncertainty is independent, it can never ever be removed. 
So what that means is that in practice, what nearly always happens is that you end up having lots of deterministic layers, and then you have some layer in between, where at the end, that adds a tiny bit of uncertainty or adds the uncertainty that is in the data. And this means these compositions can't be interpretable, uh, can't be interpreted, because I specify very clear priors, for example, in the wind farm example, of what I think the functions should look like at each point. But now it basically says I'm dead certain of one of them, and I'm taking all the uncertainty of every of these compositional functions and just chuck it into one. And that's not what we want. So what that leads to, if we look at a specific example, so here I have a sine wave that I'm going to try and model in a composition of three functions. And here I have an identity function where I'm doing the same. So you can see what's happening here. I effectively have no uncertainty in any of these layers. It's pretty much nothing where I have data. And this is what the independence assumption in these variational bounds lead to. So I like this quote. Often when people talk about the limitations of variational inference, they really mean the limitations of mean field. And I think this is absolutely true. I don't want to start doing sampling in these methods, but what I really want to do is think about how we can derive variational inference without doing adding independence assumptions that does not make sense. So what I'm going to now show is just three ways of adding back the dependency between the layers. So I'm first going to do the brute force thing, which is quite obvious. I'm just going to say that actually, instead of having each inducing point, which is these variational parts, of actually then being independent across layers, I'm just going to say they're just a big blob itself. So I'm going to jointly model them. Then I'm going to do one thing, which is a chain. So I'm going to say they depend only on the layer before and the layer after. And I'm also going to do the last thing, which is the thing that actually works, which I'm going to look at what we call inducing points as inducing locations. So the first thing then is very, very simple. So what I do, we can simply look at the graphical model. Instead of having these independent inducing points, I'm now just going to put one big blob of this. Now, obviously, this is ridiculously expensive to do because now this is going to grow cubically with the number of layers. So it's quite expensive to do. But you can do this. It's very easy to, to do and implement. Uh, the next thing, as I said, I'm going to make this chain where I can say, well, actually, there's a dependency from the layer before. And I can also do that. It's very easy to do. And then the last thing I'm going to do is something slightly different. So all of those, the first things were kind of obvious to do. So the last thing we're going to do is that we're, what we're going to say is that I'm now going to parameterize the input locations to the first layer. And the input locations to the first layer is going to be my variational parameters. And then what I'm going to do is that I'm now going to generate the output through the model that I have. And those outputs there are now going to be the parameters um, that I use to specify for the second layer. And if I do that, I can treat the functions conditionally independent given the input on the first layer. So I don't want to give that much more detail to this because doing so, I understand that not all of us are very familiar with GP variational bounds. But basically, the idea is adding back in the correlations between these things. So what I'm going to do now is just show some results mm -hmm on this. So in this case, I have this chirp function. And the first case, I got a completely independent case. The second one, I got the jointly Gaussian. And the last case here is the one where I said I parameterize everything as the input locations. Mm -hmm. 
What you can see in the last case is that now we actually get some uncertainty here. We can see that there's no uncertainty on the output, which I do not have, but I can see that there's an alignment, there's this thing here, and there's this thing here. But now each one of these are correlated with each other. So because there's no uncertainty here, if I pick one of these, it's deterministic which one I should pick here. But it is uncertain. Another example is here, which is um, something where I have heartbeat data, very little uncertainty in this in itself. If I do the factorized bound, I end up with no uncertainty in either of these layers. But what I can do, if I now have specified <coughs> this correlated bound, I end up with having an uncertainty in the alignment and I have the uncertainty in this. So in this case here, our first layer is constrained to be a monotonic function, while the second one is constrained to be this. What you can do, of course, is to not specify in those cases before, I have these very specific constraints where I had a monotonic followed by the smooth function. If you don't do that, uh, and you say, I'm going to put lots of squared exponentials, for example, you can get some more interesting behavior. So each of these colors are a different trained model. And each of the different trained models leads to a different decomposition. This here is uh, for the, let me see. Oh yeah, this is the joint Gaussian one. And this here is the um, inducing point rotation. So, this thing here kind of highlights an issue which we do not have. So what I would ideally, of course, like is that our model now parameterizes a decomposition of uncertainty. That's what I wanted. But it only specifies one decomposition. What I would actually want is clearly all of these to be part of the same model. And in order to do that, I need to be multimodal about this thing. And at the moment, we can't really do that. So I'm going to jump because I'm realizing I'm running out of time. So I'm just going to have a brief summary of what I tried to say. So my first point is this. So there's this annoying thing in the world of machine learning of some form of Bayesian superiority about things. When I started doing my PhD, then the order of things were this. First, someone did a linear algorithm, then someone kernelized it, and then you did the Bayesian version of it, and that's it, right? Job done, now we reach the supreme knowledge because we have a full statistical model. Now, it seems to be the case for a lot of things being still that same way. And I think this is slightly annoying, that something doesn't just become a statistical Bayesian model just because you put some fluff around your parameters. And I think we, you should really question why you want to do that and why it's beneficial at all. So I think we really have to think a little bit more about that than you seeing it as always the goal of placing probabilities everywhere. So, some thoughts on this. So compositions are clearly very, very useful parameterizations for learning parameters. If you haven't read this fantastic article that's linked here, um, there was an article, Neural Networks may be evolved to make Adam the best optimizer, I think is a really interesting article, which basically says, actually, there's nothing saying that the architectures that we find that are useful at the moment are actually useful in any other sense that they are article um, architectures that are useful because Adam can find a good minima to them. So adding probabilities to regularize things makes a lot of sense. I think there's plenty of proof that actually regularizing the solution space, especially if you have little data, or regularizing the parameter space makes a lot of sense. But if I can't interpret the prior, if I don't actually know what the prior does in terms of the solution space, 
I'm really questioning what I can say from that posterior. And therefore, I think a lot of those things are best thought of as actually infra or optimization methods and regularizations rather than actual uh, statistical models of the data. And the last thing is that uncertainties themselves are composite. And that's the way I need and want to use them if I want to build composite models. Um, so this leads to a couple of questions because these things are quite hard to parameterize. So my first question is, can I ever defend a composite model if my knowledge is not composite? And I do really question that. I think we're spending an awful amount of time getting these things to somehow work when what we should possibly spend a lot of time on instead is actually creating sensible priors for these flat structures instead. So these composite priors, at least to me, are very, very hard to understand. What we do know is that they can collapse your problem space in so many different ways. So you can basically fit anything. And that's an issue, right? Because effectively I'm now throwing the, my prior out the window. And that's the hard, that's a challenge. So the next annoying thing with this is then that possibly these super nice beneficial things that we that was good algorithmically that we could compartmentalize these models into these building blocks that doesn't really rhymes the same. And maybe it doesn't really make the same kind of sense when you look at statistical models. So my question then is that maybe what we need to address is that what is actually a composite probability in itself? And maybe even more importantly, what is a composite function prior? Because the prior, by placing priors on each part of the composition, doesn't generally lead if you don't have very different and very strong priors. Like some of the examples that I showed above, where I had a prior of a monotonic plus smooth. That to me makes sense. But when you start putting general things there, it's very hard to see how they actually can be interpreted. So maybe we need to start thinking about how we can think about priors in composition in general. And with that, I'm going to end. And I'm sorry that I ran over time, uh, but hopefully that's OK. I've been seeing Andrew making notes. So I'm sure there's lots of questions. Worries. Yeah, definitely. I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, the Q&A is open. And thank you very much uh, for, for, for the talk. Um, I, have, I have a quick question to, to get the ball rolling. Um, um, I really liked your commentary on sort of uh, what we are looking for in a posterior, or, or, or we should be surprised by a posterior. If we, we yeah. want knowledge, we should be surprised by the posterior. And, and the posterior that we get is not being reflected, shouldn't be, uh, the prior shouldn't be judged on the posterior we get. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on, I mean, the, it seems that the sort of, there's a huge driving force in machine learning right now, which is sort of uh, encoding sort of invariances into this, these model architectures, which is sort of a way that we can sort of uh, uh, account for our prior, incorporate our prior knowledge. So, you know, we want translational invariance in imaging, so we make convolutional neural networks. And then now, how do you do rotational invariance? Da, 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 yeah. until it goes on and on and on. Do you see this as, as sort of hacking the prior to get the posterior that you want, or or is that uh, is it something different? Anyway, I just I don't know what what are your thoughts on. That? Um, oh, let's see. No, I don't necessarily think it is right. So 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 let's see. What would worry me if it is the other way around, right? Uh, so, so I think this is, a, yeah, it becomes a tricky thing. It becomes like a chicken and an egg problem, uh, this thing, right? But I think including these invariances, that's effectively encoding a prior, right? Uh, 
So, and I think that's fine. That's exactly what you should do, right? You should limit your solution space as much as you can. But what I think becomes tricky mm -hmm. is what they actually imply in terms of um, compositions. So that's kind of my argument, right? So if I can interpret each layer in itself, right? Right. Now that makes sense. But now the the only way that actually makes, at least in my my knowledge, practical sense is that if those priors are incredibly strong, right? So now because the comp then the composition can still make sense. But my my worry, which I think is trickier, is when you put these general things on top of each other, which are not particularly strong, because what you actually end up with is this solution space that's just enormous, right? And so I think, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but, but obviously I don't think constraints is a wrong thing. It's the, mm -hmm. it's the right thing to do, right? But then it also becomes very different when you think about it as a statistical model compared to if you think about it as a predictive algorithm, they are fundamentally different, right? right. And then the notions completely change because you don't have to care about these things then. Whatever works, works, right? Because that's the only thing you are interested in saying. But if, you're, if, if you see statistical model as basically statistical hypothesis testing, if you want, right? I want to test an hypothesis then you need to understand what your hypothesis means. And if you don't do it in that way, then you're doing the inductivist fallacy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think, no, so to quote Noam Chomsky again, he had a really nice thing that he said, there's a new thing in science, he said, where we're actually equating knowledge to be able to predict previously unseen data. Mm -hmm. and, and he thought that as someone who's been around in science for a very long time, an absolutely shocking thing to say, right? right? But that's what we're doing now, right? Because we don't know what these priors are doing, but we, throw, we don't know the assumptions that we made. We just know that they work, right? Right. right. And, th and that's important, but we shouldn't equate that with knowledge right. because that's different. Okay. That's, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Freddie. Yeah. Um, he doesn't have his hand raised, so I'll assume that he doesn't want to ask it himself. Oh, he has his oh, hand. Oh, yeah, he does. He does. He does. Here it comes. Oh, uh, just one second. I'm going to stop. Oh, there's Freddie. Hello, Freddie. Hey, how you doing? Very good. Uh, thank you. Good I didn't know you. the rules. I didn't know I have to unmute to raise my hand first. Sorry, uh, teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, what was the question I asked? Right. Um, I'm just like, um, um, for my kind of simpler brain, I am really good with abstract <laughs> concepts. Um, is there, can you think of any uh, like concrete example, maybe maybe related to the application you gave about wind farms uh, or not, more general, um, of uh, when we should compose, um, use compose functions and when we shouldn't? Yeah, so let me, yeah. let me see, I'm gonna, Try, oh, hang on. Okay, I'm going to do something scary now. I'm going to try sure. and change window and see if this works. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, can you see that? Um, let me see. I removed a slide. Let me see. Can you see that image? Yes. Cool. So this is actually the result of the wind farm example that Marcus worked on. So now the wind farm is basically it's a composition of three things effectively if you have so you've got the wind and now the wind hits each turbine at different times so there's an alignment here right so you've got first a smooth monotonic function and then you have the wind has now hit the turbine how does it generate electricity from that that's basically what's happening and now the wind is often quite uncertain like we are, we are very uncertain because it gets turbulent and all sorts of things, right? So which one is the wind here? So I'll, I'll come to that. I'll explain. So this is actually okay. the composition that you have on the output. And what you can see in this case is that 
you look at this and it looks like a, just an uncertain blob of nothing, right? And it's really hard to me to say, what have I actually learned from this, right? Is this like a noisy function that just goes up and down in the middle? No, what I can actually look at, because in this case, I really know what the compositions are. So the first one is basically a monotonic function. And the second one is just the squared exponential, I think. And if you look at the samples of these, you can see that the samples look all basically the same. It just doesn't know where it is, right? Can you see mm -hmm. these three samples? It right. makes, it, it's picked up the shape perfectly, right? But mm -hmm. it doesn't know where it is. So in this case, and it was very important for us, right, is that we know that I really know how, if I know the wind, this engineer can tell me how the electricity is generated but I don't know where the wind is. I have some uncertainty around it. And now this leads to this composite model that if I generate from it, it doesn't know where this curve should be, but it knows the shape of the curve. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So when you say you don't know where the curve is, the, that curve, which... So if, you, sorry, if you look at if you look at this curve here, the yellow one, the yeah. orange one, and the red one, those are basically samples from the model. Yeah. So as you can see, all of these shapes are the same. It goes down, up, down, right. and then it starts wiggling and then it goes up. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now the thing is, it doesn't know where it goes down but it's definitely certain that it, it is goes down, right? Oh, I see. So this means that it's really uncertain. In this case, the, it's an alignment followed by a curve. It's really mm -hmm. certain about what the curve is. So there's very little uncertainty in the second layer, but there's plenty of uncertainty in the first layer. I see. So now, and this here, I know, right? And I need to put in the, the only reason why this decomposition in this case makes sense is because I've placed very different priors, right? I put one on monotonic functions and one on, you know, how squared exponential samples look like, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the model in this case will really be forced to decompose the uncertainty in the right way. So if I now would have said, and I can model this data perfectly, if I just say, cool, I'm just going to put two squared exponentials. Now, okay. yeah. what it would likely do, it will decompose this into something I, you know, that doesn't make sense. Well, it, well, it does make perfect sense according to my prior, but my prior isn't informative enough to create this composite structure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, I think that's a good example. No, I get it. Yeah. So in this case, because you're, you're exploiting your domain knowledge that uh, um, the, there is this shift uh, uncertainty, yeah. uh, but you know generally other than that, you know how the function should behave. You know that this is how you should break down your prior. Exactly, exactly. And in this case, the composite prior makes sense to me, right? Okay. I, I, can, I can clearly understand this one, right? It starts becoming complicated, and that's why I think one potentially needs to work on thinking about what is actually a prior over composite functions instead of thinking, I'm just going to specify priors on each layer, because what you end up getting is often quite unintuitive mm -hmm. due to this issue, uh, due to one side inference, but, but also the prior in itself, right? So, so I had one other example that I showed here. Let's see if I go. Um, that I skipped over, I think, very, or I did I show? Yeah, so in, in this case, right, it's, it's actually very similar to the previous case. This function here, each draw from this GP is monotonic. So this prior can only ever generate monotonic functions, which is, you know, a tiny subset in the space of functions, right? So this is a super restricted prior. We have a question from Seb now. Seb, would you like to go ahead? Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear you? It's fine. Yeah. So I guess I'm curious about this 
point about factorization between the layers. And yeah. so one piece of evidence that you show is that when you have this factorized model, the standard deviation of the draws or the, the variability of the draws at each layer is quite tight. Yeah. And when you have uh, correlations, you get much bigger variability looking at the draws from each of the functions. Yeah. And, and despite that, I think the plots that you showed, the predictive posteriors were very similar. And I guess what I'm wondering is like, yeah. basically what's happening is when you have the model that has these correlations, the layers can cancel out the work that the other layer is doing. And so it's quite natural that the posterior over the parameters or over the functions would have a lot more variation looking at each one of those individually. That's exactly right. That, that's but, exactly what I'm aiming for, even. But why is that good? Why is that good? Yeah, so, I mean, if you have a deterministic one, you maybe have much less variability at each of the layers because it's not learning a model where things can cancel each other ah. out. Um, yeah. Why are we trying to avoid that situation? Yeah, because my... Ah, super good question. So, because my task is that, again, I have specified a hypothesis or a prior over what I think these, um, uh, this factorization should be, right? Mm -hmm. And now what I want to do, and if I've specified that according to some possible variability, I don't, there isn't enough information, even though the, the transformation is completely deterministic, but as soon as I put that in a composition, the composition itself is not deterministic, right? And that's the variability that I want to capture. But I guess, so you have different models in the cases and maybe, uh, you know, maybe your intuition about how much variability there should be for each of these functions in order to get the, um, the model that is the, the true posterior is off. Like maybe it just is the case that there isn't a lot of variability in the oh, I'm, I'm, of Absolutely, absolutely, right? But this is the no free lunch, right? This is absolutely, you're completely correct. And, and I can never ever measure that, right? To, to me, there is no true posterior. A true posterior doesn't exist, right? It, that, the, a true a posterior is a reflection over what my beliefs tells me my updated belief is in reflection of that data. A true posterior to me doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So now, if I say this is my assumptions of how I think this composition should break up, now, what is the support for that breaking up, right? And then there is multiple possible ways of doing that composition. And that's the thing that I wanted to measure. Now, in this case, what, what, I, what I completely agree with you on this case, so this is clearly a toy example, right? But when it becomes interesting is if I actually have uncertainty on the output, right? That's the first case when it becomes mm -hmm. interesting because now I'm actually factorizing something, some actual uncertainty. Where does this come from? The reason why I didn't show those examples here was simply that, no, I actually wanted to show you if I set up, this is my abstraction of the world, this is my hypothesis about how this breaks up, what's the evidence of that when I could? If I would have that uncertainty, then it says something a bit more interesting. But even so, in the case when they're completely deterministic, it gets very interesting outside the data. Because outside the data here, just because I'm deterministic at the data point, does that mean I should be deterministic outside the data? But That's I guess I, I'm questioning that it's actually deterministic because they're not deterministic function draws. They're just function draws with very um, small amounts of variability. And then the structure of your model means that that variation cascades into potentially quite a lot of variation in the predictive. Yeah, so. absolutely. But that depends on my prior, right? That depends on what my hypothesis is, how likely, how much variability I think I have at each layer. But you need quite different priors 
depending on whether you're making this factorization assumption, right? Absolutely. It, the, if I change priors, my factorization is going to change completely. And that was kind of my argument, right? So that's what I'm, so now this leads to the question, well, if I don't know this then, well then my, what, what I was saying then, well then you should never build a composite model. But if you can make them, then you have that strong knowledge, right? Like as for example, in the reinforcement learning example, right? Your reinforcement learning is parameterized by the dynamic model and the policy. So now I should have strong beliefs about the policy and strong beliefs about the dynamic model. And then that should feed through. And I should, I should factorize the uncertainty in, in what I see. I could attribute it correctly to the dynamics and the policy because I need to figure out what is it that I'm uncertain of it when I do training in that in a relevant way, right? If I attribute that uncertainty wrongly, then I will end up spending work where I shouldn't spend work. Yes, I guess, I don't know, maybe there's a, I'd be interested in seeing the sort of non-toy examples because as, as far as I see it, it is important whether this sort of factorized models with tight priors versus non-factorized models with generous priors about variability. Yeah, um, I, I, can, yeah. I can tell you the latter case. So the, 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 and, and the, the latter case of just, you know, putting these, whatever, putting some, some different data, but putting a, a normal factorized bound on a composite GP, uh, it very often, leads to this collapse of uncertainty. It very rarely factorizes it in a sensible way. Uh, especially if you've got the same priors, right? So but if you basically- you cautioning us, At the start of the talk, you were cautioning us not to look at the, the learned posteriors and say, is the sensible or not? No. What, 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 I, what I did, I didn't mean it in that way. <laughs> so what I meant, if I specify the same prior on each layer, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I basically say, you now my symmetry class is that basically saying, well, actually, I think these layers are all equivalent to what I think the structure should be in them, right? While in, in the case, and in that case, now where it attributes the uncertainty in this, it becomes very hard to interpret, right? And, and in the inference scheme, all the examples that I've seen, it places the uncertainty in the end, right? Mm. Or right at the top, but it basically leads to deterministic layers. But there isn't symmetry in this model because we've got a sequential structure. So I'm not sure why we would expect symmetry between the different layers in terms of where the uncertainty sits. No, but that depends on what your prior is on the composition, right? So, so say, for example, if you're doing an alignment task, right? And that, I guess this is my argument, right? So now I know, in, in this case, I got a model of the function, but I know that the data uh, needs to be aligned first. So I first have a monotonic function followed by whatever I know about the function in the next step, right? Mm -hmm. In that case, it feels quite clear that those two are two sources of uncertainty, right? And especially in alignment, if I allow for any possible alignment, I can make those points, um, I can make any sequence fit arbitrarily well, right? Mm -hmm. So now I specify a very strong prior over my beliefs over what classes of alignments I should have, over what, um, and, that now constrains the problem, right? And now if I do that correctly inference-wise in, with a correlated thing, it will attribute the uncertainty in the right order. I'm, I'm very interested in this and it you know, speaks quite directly to some of my work. So if you're right, I need to change a lot of my views, um, but I feel like I'm hogging the questions maybe. <laughs> 
So, oh, no, 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 no. We, we, we can, what we can do, we can have a chat afterwards about this. I, I, I think there's probably something that we don't understand about each other. So we need a longer chat, I think. Yes. Wonderful. So this, I think, send is me a great time to, uh, to transition um, into our, because we're already quite uh, over time for our next meeting. Um, so hopefully we can go deeper into that uh, in the follow-up right now. So yeah, so I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, thank you uh, one last time, Dr. Carl, and uh, very very interesting uh, talk. And uh, I think we're going to move on to uh, to the other meeting uh, right now. So you sent me the link, right? <laughs>